spoke for myself briefly because I'd love to, I want to really jump into the conversation today, which is really manufacturing for dummies. I'm playing on the, uh, the, the books that are out there that always end with the word for dummies, but um, give you a nice flavor, uh, learning uh, of what's manufacturing in Business Central today. And then certainly I know there's an advanced session later on, so I can't wait for that one myself uh, to listen to that. So um, I'm the manager of operations and supply chain at a partner called Wifley. We're an accounting firm in the United States, but we have a technology consulting division. Um, there's my information if you want to get a hold of me. I do not care. I uh, love to chat with people. I'm always um, online at communities.microsoft.com on the forums, or I'm on the Doug forums, or I'm on the Navug forums. Uh, so you'll find me somewhere. A um, couple of my accolades um, here, you know, different things I've been through. I've been doing this for 23 years. So yes, I've been around since good old Nav uh, 2. Now, even 1.5 was kind of like waning away from me, but 2 was really my first one uh, back in 2000 when I first started. Um, and I'm really excited to, uh, you know, talk about manufacturing today. So let me move on. Again, quick agenda. Let's talk about the finished goods, designing it, what it means, some of the setups we have to do to kind of get the BC engine started, I call it, kind of get the manufacturing working. Um, let's go through some production orders. Let's see how that works. And, you know, what, what do we do there to make one or how does it get, you know, how does it get built? Then we'll round out our conversation with, you know, how do we do some consumption and output posting? And again, later on, you, there's another session for, that takes it to the advanced level of go into much more detail than I am, because I'm I'm going to kind of leave you with that. I'm going to wet your whistle, and then you're going to go to the next session. You're going to have much more fun taking it deeper. All right. So, so what is manufacturing? I mean, wh what does it really mean to anybody? Let me minimize this little thing. It's probably sticking up on the screen. <laughs> you know, so what is manufacturing? What, what's it all about? Um, I work with several manufacturers, all different industries, metals, um, automotive, uh, food, um, all different kinds of industries, uh, you know, even pharma. Um, but here's an example. I kind of took this one from one of my customers. They make potato chips, funny enough, um, and they manufacture them. So the ingredients, we all know about ingredients. We all buy food in a grocery store, don't we? Um, so our ingredients are our bill of materials. And we have to make this bill of material so that we can manufacture our items. And we'll go into much more detail in a little bit, but here I give you a little example. My ingredients here for a potato chip, you know, I got potatoes, I got some vegetable oil, I, maybe I got a little barbecue seasoning. I wanna make it spicy, you know, and kick it up a notch. Um, but overall, this, these are the ingredients, my component items that will actually be in my bill of material that I will manufacture with. And we'll go through an, a good example in a bit. Now my routing, we've all, probably, if you've played in BC before and you probably maybe dabbled in it, you bounced around looking at it in Kronos uh, or Fabrican, um, basically you'll see the word routing. And what, what's a routing? Routing is really the ability to take my components and make it into the finished good item that you want. So in the case of a potato chip, I have to maybe blend something where I'm going to go and wash the potatoes, slice the potatoes, cut them into a certain size, boil the potatoes or fry the potatoes, as one would say, and then produce a season it and then put, put it into a bag and package it and box it up. So overall, the routing really takes the different components at different stages and passes it through the manufacturing facility, the different machines, set, machines that you're using, or maybe the different people that operate machines because we have, we'll talk about work centers and machine centers in a little bit. You can see the picture kind of takes you from beginning to end from left to right. I've got my raw material where I'm taking it and possibly I'm putting it into a machine that's actually mixing it up. And I'm basically taking it from there and I'm moving it down the conveyor belt line and maybe I'm sheeting it or cutting it and forming it and frying it. And you can see it's going through an entire process. This actually is uh, an image, a drawing image that they would, when they were building the potato chip facility, they were actually envisioning how they were going to make their line. It did not come out this way, trust me. Um, buildings are not so perfect, and uh, they actually had to make different different parts of the uh, route, the step here, were in different rooms. It was a pretty funky conveyor system, but it ended up being kind of like this in the long run to make potato chips. Um, Large-scale manufacturers always require forecasting and planning, and plenty of them want the automated processing. Now, again, automated processing being I want my machines can supply me my electronic data that I can actually take that data, 
based on runtime maybe or counts, and I can take that data and put it into my output journals. So a lot of the sophisticated tech machines that are out there today, and especially in the last 15 years, you can take data out of them and they can actually fill in the output journal or a production journal, or if you're using some of the advanced tools, the apps that are out there for BC, like a shop floor control, MES, you can fill in those answers as well using some automated processing. The planning engine, you know, is obviously we're going to fill in the planning engine on the item card. So sophisticated planning is required so that you can be leaner and you can obviously make sure that you've got your raw material in-house before you start a production order. And again, the larger the customer or the larger the person using Business Central, forecasting is inevitable because your, your customers will supply forecast to them so you can enter a forecast in the system. So you can have all that material, finished good product on the shelf, ready to go for the start of every month or basically week or however you want to do your forecast. So it is critical to kind of look at those things as you get more advanced and as you want to get more kind of like a be ahead of the curve or be very customer aware that you need inventory to meet all the demand that's going to come through based on a forecast or a plan. Moving on here a little bit here, let's talk about that bill of material and let's talk about that capacity. So again, here's a production order. It's a pretty basic one in Business Central. I think we've all seen the great old, you know, Kronos bicycle. And this is my basic bike. I kind of built this one as a, as a joke, not the bicycle or the fancy touring bike that comes with Kronos, but I felt like playing with one and I called it my basic bike here. Um, all bill of materials really come with uh, four major areas here. And for the most part, the, the header really covers what's the item and what's my unit of measure. I'm going to put that back into the warehouse or my location as Business Central calls it. What's the unit of measure? It's going to be stored on inventory in that I'm going to manufacture in because it's a bomb here. I'm going to manufacture to a unit of measure called piece. And then that obviously that item is going to be put back into inventory when it's all outputted and finished. The other thing to notice, there's a status field. This status field allows us to create production bombs. It allows us to both certify them, which is a requirement to be used in the system. If it's not certified, you cannot manufacture that item. And is also under development, which allows you to kind of change it along the way. We'll talk about changing in a second here, how you can change things and kind of make uh, do different steps along the way to make new versions. But we'll talk about that in a second, not right now. Obviously, down below is all of your components, that front wheel, the back wheel, the chain, etc. The item number from the, obviously, your inventory, all the items from the item cards. Well, how many pieces or units do I need to make a, just one bicycle or one basic bike? So here I'm going to put a quantity of one. Let's say I'm making, for instance, today I'm making uh, something that's a liquid. Obviously, you know, maybe I need water or maybe I need... Um, uh, you know, a marinara sauce for, you know, maybe you're making some sauce, an Italian dressing or something. You can do the, this quantity per is to make quantity of one unit of that um, item here. So you might do things in decimals. As you know, BC allows up to the five decimal places. So be aware of that to make sure that you've got your conversion from the component ingredient or the component to the unit of measure to make the bicycle above. So if by chance I was doing say a liquid or something that was in ounces and I'm making something in pieces or eaches, make sure there's a conversion to get you back there or else when you finally manufacture, you're not gonna get the right pick or the right pull of the component quantities that you need to make X number of bicycles. Or in my case, it's a bicycle. Obviously scrap. You are allowed to put a scrap percentage on the line. You have other places you can do scrap percentages. For, for instance, on the routing, you can do both a percentage and a fixed quantity. You can do a fixed value there that is allowed. This, if I did put a scrap percentage of 10%, what would happen is when I go get my front wheel, I know it's going to sound really funny, but I need one front wheel to make one bicycle here. Obviously, if I put a scrap percentage, say, of 10%, it's gonna go out and get me 1.10 of that front wheel. I know it sounds funny because obviously wheels cannot be in, uh, in you know, decimal places, but you get the gist of this is that it will actually tell you to go get more of a component because you're gonna end up scrapping it in the end anyway. Last but not least, I love talking about routing link codes. It is my, it's my passion. I think it's the coolest thing out there whereby you can take your components and actually tie them to the routing step. So let's say I'm actually, I'm at the end, let's say I'll use a car. 
the first thing we do is we build the frame of a car. So we obviously need steel and we need, you know, some other components. And then we finally need to put the seats in. So maybe the seats are put in really towards like the 20th step. You can actually attach using a routing link code the different components that go to the different routing steps so that you're not really picking inventory until it's really necessary. And then you're really picking it based on that routing step. It also helps when you're picking those inventory, depending upon the flushing method, but that's a conversation for another day. Let's move on. All right. Mentioned there's a lot of little toys in here. Here's the first toy. Let's talk about copying bombs. Obviously, as you know, you've been, I think everybody on this call has probably been in Business Central for a while. You know you can do lots of copy functionality. You know, you copy purchase orders, sales orders. You know, you can copy items. And you can also copy bill of materials. Um, it's a cool thing. You basically will go in and you can go to your list. And from the list, you can just click copy bomb. And it basically will create a new bill of material copying the one that you're telling it where it's coming, the source it's coming from. Um, it, excuse me, um, the copy bomb lines, you know, takes the source, moves it to the target bomb, which is, let's say I'm going to copy 1000. In my case, I made a copy of to 1003, the basic bike. You saw that here, um, here in the image. And that's what it's doing. It's copying all the information. I can then delete and pick and choose what line component lines I want to keep, take away and stuff like that. So basically add and take away using the basic function of Business Central. I can do bomb versions. I mentioned when we kind of showed that first slide about the bill of material where it has a version field and you can see it pretty much right um, over you know, the status here, but you can do a version cop, uh, both copy and creation. So one of the things about versions, very, very, very important for those people who have engineers or who have people who do do production bomb maintenance and management. But when that bomb, let's say I have a bomb and we use the bicycle and let's say the seat in the bicycle today changes from um, a very nice, comfortable seat to a racing bike seat, you know, a fancy racing bike seat. So I can actually say, well, okay, now we're going to change this bomb, the item, the, the basic bike, and we're going to use a racing bomb seat. So I can come in, click the function that basically creates a new version, and then basically copy a bomb, you know, copy the original bomb over, change my basic seat maybe to the racing bike seat, and it attracts it. You can put in an effective date of when you want to start using the racing bike seat. One thing to know about versions, whichever version, the starting date of that, that if the starting date of a version, okay, is active, meaning it's in, it's within the date work date that I'm in, that's the version that's going to be used. So for instance, if I have a master bomb, which you saw my, let's say the, the bicycle 1000, and then I copied, I made a new version called the basic bike. Let's call that version A uh, using the bicycle, of course. Um, that version that went in effect today, that's that's going to be my version in effect. And I'll show you an example in a second because we're going to demo all this through because I want to show you it in action in Business Central. But only the version that has a starting date that's within the work date is the active version of the bomb. The master version is still there. It's stored. Any other versions are not that do not have a starting date within the work date are not active at that time, which means it will not be taken into account when producing production orders. All right, it is demo time. It's time really to just get into the system. I'm going to hit escape, so I'm going to bounce out real quickly, everybody. Jump open to Business Central, and I'm sure you can see my screen since I still see the red bar up top showing that it's visible to you guys. All right. So Thanks, let's go Steve. Through. Looking good. Yes. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Um, let's go through and let's, uh, let's get to that bicycle. Let's go in and let's go to the item card. And again, um, I've done a lot of, I put in a lot of bookmarking up here so I can jump around quickly uh, for our demonstration to keep the, the fluidity of this to stay within our 50 minutes to an hour. Um, again, let's open that bicycle so we can just see what it's like. And again, here's the bicycle. I think everybody's been seen an item card before. A couple of main things to realize when you're on a, an item that is manufactured, that is a finished good, always remember a few things. Uh, for me personally, depending upon your costing method as a manufacturer, um, for me, standard costing is, is the most popular in manufacturing. 
Other folks do specific costing that I've worked with. That means that my manufacturing cost becomes my specific cost. So it's a one, almost like a one, every time I manufacture that item, whatever the cost is of that manufacturing run, that's the cost for that specific outputted item here if I use specific costing, which as you know, if you do a drop down here, you know, you do have FIFO, LIFO, but again, if I'm a man, this is a manufactured item. In normal cases, I always, most of my customers pick standard or specific. Those are the two most popular ones today from a costing method. Let's move on from here and after looking at the costing. Um, and again, some people have asked me the question, hey, Steve, you know, can I just use average? You know, everybody thinks average is the best one out there. I'm not a true believer in it. I mean, this is a personal preference as an ex-accountant. I don't like average costing for manufacturing. I think it's it will not be very true um, because you could be melding inventory from something two years ago to something today. And you know how bad it's been since COVID with you know supply and materials here where the costs have gone up greatly. So if I had to average something where I bought something for say 50 cents one day, and now the cost is $3.50 because of the way of the world we're living in, um, it's not really the cost, uh, it's it's melding two numbers, and that's, that's giving me a true cost for that item for during that manufacturing process. So again, I'm not a believer in it. I'm not saying that people don't use it. There are people who do. But again, if you're asking me and it's a personal decision, I just don't use average costing when it comes to manufacturing. All right, let's move on here and let's bounce around here and just scroll down a couple of things you have to set up to be a manufacturer. First and foremost, my replenishment system, make sure that that finished good item is set to production order. Purchasing, as you know, I'm buying all my raw components, production orders, I'm manufacturing my item in my manufacturing facility. So that's first, that's the most important thing to look at there in terms of replenishment system. If I look at over here, come over here to my manufacturing policy, am I a make to stock item? Meaning, do I just put this on the shelf? Am I just gonna keep making these based on my forecast, based on my plan, de basically de demand and supply? Make the stock means I'm going to put them on the shelf. If they're always going to be there. I'm always going to plan for them. There's going to be plenty on the shelf. I can meet all my customer demands. I'm going to make them to stock. Now, make to order, flip it around. I'm only going to make this bicycle if an order comes through, or obviously if there's a, a forecast to an order coming through. I'm going to make that item in uh, to put on the shelf. So I'm not going to carry a lot of inventory. I'm going to kind of be lean and only make them when the order kind of shows up or I'm told to make it manually. <laughs> We'll go over routing and production in just a second. Um, scrolling down here, you have lot size. What's my typical lot size when I manufacture this bicycle? I always want to I always want to manufacture 100 bicycles every time I manufacture. And we use lot size for other reasons too, but we'll talk about that when we get to the routing uh, section of our demonstration this morning. Flushing method. What is the flushing method or what is the method in which I will consume my item components in my manufacturing process? Do I manually enter them on the screen in a consumption journal or production journal? Do I forward flush them, meaning when my production order is produced, the second it's put out, out into Business Central and ready to go to the shop floor, I will flush all my components immediately. I will forward flush them. Backward flushing means as I complete a routing step, I will backward flush them. And when I, I finish the entire production order, I'm gonna backward flush everything, all my components out of the system. And then of course, the last two is a great warehousing tool. I like this part, which is I when I pick it, I, I have to pick it when I forward flush or I'm picking it to backward flush. So I'm using some of the warehousing activities of picking here in my manufacturing process. A lot of people ask me what's the most popular. The most popular is backwards. However, lately, Manual is becoming a big uh, a big uh, to do. I think a lot of companies, given COVID, has really given them a chance to kind of think about, you know, what is my real cost? And they're doing it manually. They really want the operator to kind of enter what they've done or the warehouse operator to pick the units that are going into the production order. So manually is becoming very uh, popular lately. Again, under the planning parameter here, my reorder policy, um, this one, is more for how you're going to look at it from a, a reordering policy, but uh, for the when you're doing your manufacturing, do it, am I looking at it lot for lot? I'll go into this later on. It's more of an advanced thing because I want to stick really to the manufacturing area of the system. So for now, um, 
other than talking about some of these other planning parameters, which we'll, we should talk about next year in another session, we should have a session just on planning. I'm going to jump up here to my production bomb so we can open it and go look at my production bomb, and then we'll look at my routing, and then we'll go back to the slide presentation. So here I'm going to open this up. As you know, you click your three ellipse dots and go over to edit. And my screen will widen up here, and here's my bicycle. You can see my bicycle is here. It's got, it's in pieces. It is certified. If I did want to play with this, of course, I can go under development. And if I change something, obviously I can recertify it at the end. We'll do that in demonstration a little later on. You can see across the bottom here, my items. Now there are two types of items. One's called item in production bomb. Production bomb actually stands for a bomb. I'm going to use another bomb in my bomb. And we call them in the industry, a lot of times in the manufacturing world, people call them the phantom bomb, whereby I don't want to put it on the shelf, meaning I'm not going to make it a subassembly and store it. I'm only going to manufacture it when it comes time for me to manufacture the finished item. So I want to have a bomb because it requires a whole nother production order to make it because it's pretty detailed, but I'll actually not shell, put it on the shelf. I'm not going to give it a formal item number. So we use it as a phantom bomb. And again, you saw in the picture, here's my front wheel, my quantity. Um, I've got the unit of measure, my scrap, and my routing link code that I have that I have here. And again, quantity per, make sure you put the right quantity that you require for that item to be used. So here, as a joke, in my example here, I'm going to add some cocoa powder because I want to put some cocoa powder on the handlebars. So when I get hungry, I'm going to start licking the handlebars. And I need 0 0.025 per bicycle to make to put the cocoa powder on the handlebars. And again, let's do a quick one here. If we want to make a real quick one, as you know, you can put under here, we can click new. I can hit the next item number. We can put a description. We can put test bike. We can put the unit of measure. Again, drop down or type, as you know, BC finder as you type. We can type, look for the piece. And again, we can come here and start entering some item numbers. And again, you can come in here and we pick, you know, we've got my front wheel. And of course, quantity per, just like the example I just did. And again, you fill it in. So this is pretty easy to put it in. Another way of doing it is it will step back off this. We'll go back to our main one is if I go to process and I click versions. In this case, I don't have any versions, but as I mentioned kind of in our earlier discussion with the slides, I'm going to make a version A. I'm just going to put, you know, bicycle or let's call it bike version A. And the unit of measure, let's just call it a piece again. Let's give it a starting date of today, just to show that we're doing it today. And again, now I'm going to use my copy. Let's pick the right copy button, Steve. It'll copy it from the production bomb, basically the master. It brings all the rows in. Look how fast that was. It brings everything in. And now I'm going to change things around. So let's say I hate this saddle seat. I don't like it. I'll delete the saddle seat. I'll say, yeah. And let's go down to the bottom and we'll pick a new item number item and then we're going to add in another seat so maybe we'll pick um you know the frame and just make believe we're going to add another frame here we'll call let's call it a seat today and we'll add another quantity here again you are you have to come in and certify it and when you do certify it if you go back to the main screen now we come off the sub screen if we refresh ourselves real quickly, and we'll do a 30 second refresh here. And the system comes up. And there we go. Uh, let me back off this list. Oh, it's still thinking. <laughs> we jump back in. Apologies for the delay. The BC gerbils are moving slow on the server today. I think it's because of all the updates it's doing. And we come in here and obviously we've got this bicycle. If we look up, if we go to the versions, we've got the A1, it's starting on 922. Um, it did not update my active version, um, but it should have. That's actually kind of funny that it did not do that. A shameful of that, I'm gonna have to report that in why it did not update on refresh. Um, but it should have updated the active version um, to 922. Uh, meaning that's the active one in play, not the master one. Apologies for that not updating. Don't know why, but I'm going to have to put a ticket in as to why it's not updating on the same day. 
I'm going to step off this just to leave me at the list if everybody is fine with that. I'm going to jump back to our slides because I want to pick up where we left off. Talk a little bit about capacity. Uh, again, I'm sure everybody who's been in the manufacturing space knows that in from, from a capacity standpoint, Business Central thinks of work centers and machine centers. You can have like people can be machines or both machines can be machines. Or basically, a lot of people will just make a work center that's called like, let's call the work center the drill press. And there's two operators in that work center at the drill press. And that's kind of where you keep the operators will be in here. Or again, you can make them machines down here, and people up here. And again, you can do people and machines and you can roll them up to a single work center. And from this work center, you can roll them up. You can combine two work centers to be a group of work centers. So obviously, the structure really starts with the work center group. If you want to have a group of work centers, certainly create a work center group first and then create all the work centers underneath. And again, popular, I mean, if you do want to get down to the machine, have a machine record its time separately versus the people recording its time, obviously you'll create machine centers and of course you'll create the individual operators. A lot of people ask me what's the most popular. I personally, if we're going to gather data from a machine, I always like to keep the machine separate from the person. However, if the operator really is just, you know, I don't need machine data, my operator's time is built, my operator's, the machine cost is built into the work center cost. So I just basically will create a work center per uh, whatever that is, whether it's a drill press, maybe it's a, a cutting board, maybe it's a laser machine, um, depending on what work centers, what kind of industry you're working in. Now, work centers and machine centers, there's two separate cards. Very important that we actually know what the differences are. Um, this is a uh, here. I've got my work center card on one side, and I've got my machine center card on the right side. You'll notice here I've got a work center group because machine centers point to work centers, work centers point to work center groups. So realize that on the header you've got an extra field to accommodate or to fill in. One other thing about work centers, and we'll basically we'll talk about that in, in this right now. But when you are doing your work centers and you are thinking of a machine or a person or a group of people, when you fill them out, this is where you're going to put your what I call your hourly wage if it's a person. So here I'm going to put my average maybe hourly wage. I'm going to put my indirect percentage overhead or my payroll benefits, payroll and tax benefits. Um, I'm going to put my general overheads, which is a flat rate, like a dollar figure. Or I'm going to put that in so that my total cost for my work center includes my dollars, taxes and benefit dollars, and my overheads to, so that make sure that when I incur every one minute, one hour, I'm recording uh, enough capacity entry here to capture all my costs from a labor perspective, plus my material cost to make sure I'm going to be selling it in a profitable state. I got to know the true profit of that item. So I want to capture all those overheads here and all the benefits. And then, of course, my direct labor here. Um, it's important to do this. I like to do things in minutes. It's a personal thing. Uh, I have come from the manufacturing space and everything I did there was in minutes. I like to see whole numbers on a screen. I don't like to see decimals. So if I did something in an hour and I only worked 20 minutes, remember, it's going to be it's got to take the one hour and divide it into 20 minutes and you're going to have to do, you're going to have to enter something in a decimal state. So, again, I like to do things in minutes. It's just much easier when it comes to work centers and capacity entry. All right, let's move over to my routing. We talked about that. You saw that when we discussed it earlier about the whole the concept of having a routing here. But my bicycle here has a nice, easy routing, goes through a series of work centers and machine centers, as you can see in the image. And one thing to note on the top is the word type. So what does type mean when it comes to routing? So there's a serial type and a parallel type. Serial type means put one foot in front of the other. I'm doing it in a step-by-step -step mode. Parallel means that I can do things in, sometimes simultaneously or in parallel. Maybe I can go and the first step is to pull all my raw material. My second step is one person's gonna cut the frame and the other person's gonna start putting the spokes on the wheels. So I could do that in parallel and then I'll come back and build my bicycle later on, maybe in the final assembly. But again, you could set up these both in a serial and parallel state. Um, there's uh, to kind of give you an example of serial and parallel. Serial here, again, one foot in front of the other. Parallel routing, really, you should, must start off with a single step. 
you then can branch off into parallel steps. You can also do parallel and serial at the same time, as you can see in my bottom example, where I can go from 10 to 20 and 30, but then when 20 finishes, it goes to 40, and then it all comes back to 50 to do final assembly. Um, it's, a, it's a personal preference. I, I love sitting with the production floor people to say, how do you operate? Because obviously creating a parallel example allows them to be much more efficient than waiting for obviously 10 to 20, 20 to 30, and so on. So again, talk this out, really think about this, but you can set up these routings pretty simply in Business Central. All right, let's jump back real quick. One of our final demos here uh, before we kind of wrap up. Uh, in a, a couple more slides and then some more discussion here. But let's go in and I want to open up the work center. So let me jump off to my main screen and I'm going to click on work center because I really want to show you what I was talking about. And I'm going to use this, the assembly, the paint packaging work center to kind of talk about it out loud. So I did put the packaging work center in a work center group just in case I want to do reporting in JET or maybe I want to do some, um, I want to see the load reporting based on a full work center group versus an indi individual work center. Um, one thing to note here is here's my direct unit cost. It's my average wage, you know, at a at a minute level. You see the word minute down here. My indirect cost percent. Again, I always believe this to be payroll and benefits because it's a percentage of somebody who works one minute. So let's make believe in your company. You might have health benefits, and again, I know it's different for different countries. Some uh, because I know there's social medicine and different places that don't have social medicine. But overall, it's it's basically what indirect costs that relate to the, what I call the employee should be put here. So I'm going to put here like 2%. I'm going to tab. And you can see my my amount went up to $1.53. And then for every time I'm I'm trying to work one minute in the floor on the floor to manufacture, it's going to cost me an extra dollar, you know, and to cover all my overheads for my company to make sure I'm profitable. And again, a lot of these numbers will come from your accounting and your costing team anyway. So I have $2.53 for every minute I work. My capacity for this packing is one human being or one person. Again, put the right number of people here. Again, I could put two. And efficiency, make, make, make sure you fill out efficiency, please. This really is helping when it comes to the MPS side of it, when it does planning and scheduling, because it believes it's looking at the shop calendar for this work center to know how efficient you are. Am I always working eight hours every day? I can't take a break, I can't go to lunch, I can't go to the bathroom? Or am I really more, the norm, from a, from my perspective, the norm runs about 80%. So most work centers are 80% efficient. They have a couple of breaks, they take a lunch, they dilly-dally. So, so most people are about 80% efficient in a given shift. Again, You'll have warehouse information you can put out there, but in addition, you can look at your work center again and look at the actual calendar. Every calendar is how many working minutes, in my case, do I have in a given day to manufacture said item or said release production orders? So again, that's your work center. And again, it's really good. Let's jump off the work center card real briefly and we'll jump out which off routing because we discussed the routing. And let's look at that bicycle real quick. So I can show you what a bicycle is like. And here's the more the bigger picture of this because I wanted to show you this. You'll see that I'm serial. And again, I could have made this parallel. But when I set up this work center, I did set up routing links. And you didn't see that in my picture because I wanted to show you it here. But here I'm actually saying my first work center or my wheel assembly, um, the next step is going to be the 20 and 30 and 40. You can see the flow and where it's coming from. But here I've actually said, I want you to go to the, the bomb we ma made earlier, and I want you to take the routing link bombs that are called 100 and put all that, and I'm gonna use those built components in the wheel assembly. And then the next time might be, oh, I'm gonna take the routing links that were called 300 for my components, and I'm gonna use them in this machine called control. Maybe it's a control test. You are allowed work centers that actually point to outside subcontractors. So let's say I'm manufacturing a metal product or some sort of metal product, and it has to be anodized, or maybe it has to be painted and you don't have a painting facility on shop and you got to send it down the street to get painted. So in addition to setting up a subcontractor, which you're allowed, and pointing that work center to a vendor card, it will actually create the purchase order when you run the subcontracting worksheet. And I'm sure in the advanced session, they'll go through that a little bit. Last but not least over here, I will set up my setup time and my run time. Again, I do things in minutes. I'm a, uh, doing everything in minutes, as you can see. 
But I also can do a couple of other things is that if you see the word lot size here, this lot size is very important if obviously if the item lot size is not there, but the lot size is important when it comes to setup time. If you want the setup cost to be on in, in the manufacturing cost of your item and you have setup time to make those machines or to turn on the machine or to do something in each operation, you need to tell it what lot size you're going to use. So typically when I go in and I'm, maybe I'm doing some big CNC press or a laser machine and I have to kind of set the computer, kind of make sure it's all calibrated and maybe it takes 30 minutes, just make believe. So what is a typical lot size? for which I'm gonna do a run. Is it 100 units? Is it 5,000 units? And that lot size is needed because it will take the setup time and use the lot size and divide the two to come up with the individual setup unit cost per item that you're manufacturing. And that's gonna be that additional cost we put on the unit, uh, the standard cost, in my case, my unit cost here for that item. It won't use, it's not 110 times $2 that we were doing here. It's going to be, a, it's going to take the 110 divided by my lot size and then come out with, oh, okay, that's, you know, a dollar. I'm just going to make it a simple example here. So it's a do every time I set up one item, it costs me a dollar extra or 25 cents in my, you know, and stuff like that. A couple of other small fields, but then we'll move on. You can set up the fixed scrap. Remember I mentioned that earlier, you can have a scrap factor on the production bomb, but you can also set up a fixed quantity factor here on the routing. So for every time I manufacture, I always lose one item. Send ahead quantity allows you in, in places where you've uh, obviously in serial or parallel, if there are times that one work center works faster than the other, and you wanna get those items downstream faster and you can, you can actually push some finished good finished quantity down to the next um, routing step. Set, you can set some send ahead quantities here so that the next routing step can begin based on that send ahead quantity. Last but not least, just to note here, you can enter comments by, by line, by routing line. You can enter the tools. Maybe you need a die or a, um, a certain bit, maybe you're on a machine or a certain setting. You can actually put pers very specific people that can only do this thing that you know Joe or Sally have to be here to run the, the laser machine. They're the only ones qualified, as well as some quality measures you can put on each routing step. If you want to kind of capture some quality data or tell the operator, hey, by the way, you better go test, check the electric and put a you know a voltage meter on it, you know, on different routing steps and things like that. So very important on the routing card to do that. Um, routing cards have the same. Uh, ability, you can do versions and you can certainly copy the routers to make new versions and the active version would be listed here um, when necessary. So um, to make an active version. All right, let's step back and go to my main screen and let's jump back to our slide deck. Pick up where we left off. All right, a couple of things you have to do in manufacturing to start the entire manufacturing process is just like in everywhere in BC, there's always something to set up somewhere. Inventory setup, you know, there's there's always some screen, um, warehouse, you know, location cards for warehouse setup or different areas, service setup. But we've got manufacturing setup. And on the manufacturing setup, again, you're going to set up what's the base count my works. You're going to set up the calendars. You know, what is my default calendar here? What's my shift calendar for my different work centers or machine centers? Um, over and above the basic calendar that you do in BC. That calendar, the, the, where you see the word base calendar, that's more for when's the warehouse, the receiving and shipping portion of Business Central. I believe that runs more of the warehouse operation. When's the doors open? When's the doors close? When can a shipping person arrive? When can it uh, send, deliver stuff to the building? When can I ship stuff out and stuff like that? Whereas the manufacturing calendars or the shift calendars all relate to when do my work centers work? outside of the note outside of maybe the, they might work different hours than your typical your nine to five but my manufacturing facility is five to two or whatever it is you've got some other setups that of course are done on the shop you know in addition to manufacturing on the manufacturing setup screen like dampener setup which uh, again that's more of an advanced setting again we'll talk about probably talk about that in the advanced class today but i think next year let's have a a, a planning session talk about all the planning fields and what they mean on the item card and what do they do mean on the manufacturing setup because it does 
play into how planning and how the planning worksheet works and what's it going to do? How's it going to react to open documents or demand and supply? So it's a great session for next year that I hope to uh, do. So it's a really fun one for me when it comes to planning. Now, production order statuses. I, for those of you who've been in the system in Business Central, you probably sit there and you maybe you've gone to the menu structure where you just want to look at the menus of what's under the ma uh, manufacturing granule. Here you've got five choices, simulated, plan, firm plan, released, and finish. What do they all mean? Give it to me in plain, in my case, plain English. So obviously simulator is really used for the quoting. So you've got a sales department and the sales department is dying to know how much the real cost is going to be to manufacturers or maybe an engineering department and they want to merge the bomb and the routing kind of simulate how much cost or what's the cost going to be for this production order if i send it to the floor so it's used mainly for quoting and calculating the costs to figure out how much the cost is going to be so you know how much you're going to sell sell it for planned and firm planned are used in the planning um you know it's used in the planning engine uh, firm plan especially planned also but um it's all for that planning worksheet because obviously if you leave firm planned and planned documents out there the planning engine is going to see them. The planning engine is going to basically tell you in case you need components, it's going to basically tell you when you run MRP, hey, you better go buy some components because guess what? You don't have any because you're thinking about manufacturing these items in the queue. So firm plan and plan is, think of it as in the queue. Obviously, release production order is the most famous because that's the one that actually when you do release it, it's considered on the floor or in production whereby the the operator in the different work center is going to record time it's they're going to record scrap they're going to obviously consume the components they're going to do consumption and last but not least they need to do some output and output the finished product so we can put it on the shelf and ship it off to our customers when i am done with the release production order and i've recorded all my transactions i'm going to basically change the status from a release to finish at which time it will change the status, put it into history, but also when it's manufacturing, and for those of you who've been in the manufacturing space, it's going to record all of my variances. I've got my material variances, capacity variances, I've got my overhead variances that are related to capacity, I could have a subcontractor variance, whereby the subcontractor says, I'm always going to charge $1 for every unit I need. You want me to do something for? And he charged me $1.25 today. So I've got a variance. All right, let's move to our next slide. Talk about working in those production orders. So now I've got this release production order here in front of me. Very simple. Um, they can be created from a sales order directly using the order planning function. You can actually push a production order right to the system, if firm planned or released. You can do it. Going to run MPS, MRP, and you basically can create production orders from there as well. So that is another way of creating these production orders. Or you can do them manually, um, but I, I'm sure you're not doing many manual ones unless they're emergency ones. So here's a bicycle. It's telling me I'm going to manufacture my item number 1000, the bicycle. I'm going to make 27 today. And down below, after I click pro after I click the process and the regenerative plan and or basically recalculate, um, it will insert both the item that's going to be manufactured, and underneath this item will be its routing steps and all the components from the production bomb. It will tell me when I will start this manufacturing process and when I will end this manufacturing process to make a total of 27 units. Obviously, when we are in here and we drill into that on the lines, I mentioned you will actually see all the components and the routing. So at the top here, you see my routing steps. You saw me show you that on the screen a little while ago during our demo. Um, I've got all my work centers. I've got the start time for each work center, how much time is going to be incurred, what's the expected runtime based on the quantity of 27. Don't forget, this is all exploded out that says it's going to take for 27 units of bicycles, it's going to take me basically in this case, 12 minutes, you know, basically to do this or 12 hours because it's going through a full day. Here are the components that are the production bomb, again, to make 27 units. Everything, as you know, in my bomb was always equal to one to make it easier for our demonstration today. So obviously the, my expected quantity I'm going to pick is the number 27. Obviously, as I record and consume, if I only want to do these very slow, 
and let's say I only pick one front wheel, as I consume it, as I'm taking it and picking it, it's going to keep, this is going to drop down to 26, 25, 24, as I'm consuming everything here. All right, let's jump back in our last demo before we open it up to questions and answers. I'll jump back in here and obviously we'll go to our production order. Let's open up our release production order here. And let's create a quick new one. And we hit enter just to accept the next number in the number series. Again, source the source type, we'll talk about that in a second, but let's make that bicycle one more time for our demonstration. And we'll put a quantity out here of say 25, just to have that. I mentioned the first thing we're gonna do is refresh our production order. So we're gonna calculate out. It will prompt you with a, a pop-up, basically, you want to, it's going to calculate the lines, the routings, what I need for components. It's going to pretty much check everything. And obviously the first thing I do is click OK. I count maybe a few seconds here. It goes out. It will look to see at all my component, everything here that I'm calculating. And if the gerbils are fast enough, it comes back and it tells you, OK, Steve, you can make this bicycle, which you think you're going to have a due date of today. Um, but basically it's not possible because I have no inventory. And I would have went, I would have started to make 25 bicycles back on 1231, 2021, because I'm trying to make a deadline of six, seven, and I don't have that much time. Let's fix this just for our example. And I wanted to do that just to show you that this system is intelligent. It's going to tell you when it thinks you should have started something to meet a deadline, but let's then make this 630. And again, I can just refresh this. Runs the same process here. Um, if you do make a mistake, just go back and fix it. Um, it is fine. It is intelligent enough. Um, but one thing is it does take into account all the time in the different work centers, your availability, if you're overloaded, when you should go back and start things. So it, it does look back to see, am I manufacturing this going backwards in time or am I looking manufacturing this looking at forwards in time? That was that question you saw when I open when I click refresh here. What direction am I going to look? I look back in time or should I look forward in time? If I say forward in time, which it will go back and you'll see this date update and it basically still wants me to manufacture it back starting in December of 2021. I know that I have very little inventory. I know that I'm in a lot of trouble and I should have started this a long time ago based on the fact that I've overloaded every work center because this is my demo database. So that's something to just realize um, in our presentation. Don't get confused by the fact that um, I should have done this in the past. Now, one thing to note, I mentioned also that my routings and my components are here. I love looking at these. Yes, you also have dimensions on the line. So they do they do pull in the dimensional information. I know one of the sessions um, that were earlier this morning, we had dimensions. So if I look here at my routing, you'll see it explodes out my routing. Just like you saw in the image I built, it has all the information here. Here I did a little fun play. Um, I actually changed it out. So it actually made um, my, my previous work center was 50 and the next operation is 40. So you see me doing a little play here. You can, I can say that this work center 200 is waiting for work center 10, 20, and 30. And you can see, like I said, parallel and serial can be done simultaneously. Uh, and again, I was playing with this uh, on this bicycle one. You can see the start and end times. I know this doesn't make any practical sense considering my routing time is 25. <laughs> Basically it's 0.25. Uh, I'm, I made my work centers in uh, 0.25 of a minute. So it is kind of funny that I'm doing this, but I want to show you that anything is possible in Business Central uh, when you do set this up. Please make sure that when you are setting this up, test everything you do here. Don't just take it for, that, for granted that it's supposed to be right. Please go make sure you actually look at those routings. You look at the components. You run your cost shares to make sure the money looks right. Make sure it looks respectful and do a couple of tests to make sure it actually looks really cool, that make sure the costs are coming through and you can post uh, the bombs and routings. Again, components, here it's just um, telling me how many units I'm gonna make, how many quantity pers I need here, two per, so I need 50 to make 25 bicycles, I need 50 here, because two of each, one of each, and stuff like that. Um, yes, my demo database has a pretty funky thing going on here, availability. And what this is, it's an app that basically tells you, uh, I found a, an organization over um, in Europe that did this app. And basically it tells me when I ran out of inventory, even at the component level, 
anything that's red means you don't got it even on hand. So good luck finding it. So you can't, that's why my dates are pretty ridiculous. I have no inventory to even manufacture anything. And I sh should have started a long time ago. All right. One last thing on my production bomb. I want to mention this on the bicycle. I just mentioned is my source type. And then I'll, I have a couple of source types here. You see the word item, family, and sales header. Obviously, when I create a production order from directly from an order, guess what? It's coming from a sales header. So obviously, there's a one-to-one -one relationship there. Yes, when you run planning, um, the order tracking will know it comes from a sales order uh, from the order tracking perspective. But if you want to go direct from that sales order to production order, it will tell you it came from a sales header, the source of why you're manufacturing something. For families, families are pretty cool. I kind of like the family, especially when you have what I call the like items or a family of items that are going to go through the same routing steps. So I want to combine. Um, so it's really utilized when you want to manufacture more than a single item, but related items and group those items together. So you kind of create a family. So let's say I'm creating the touring bike and I'm going to create the regular bicycle. They both go through the same process. So if I did that, what would end up happening is if I did change this to family and I haven't really done anything with this one, um, it's gonna ask you what's the name of the family and you'll create these families. Under the families, you're basically defining how many of the regular finished goods are under there. So here I've got a front wheel, make believe, and a touring bike, I need one of each to make it. So my family is made up of two items. And when you do manufacture these like items, which go through pretty much the same routing steps, when I do refresh it, it basically will go out here, and again, I'm doing this because I really haven't played with this production order yet. Um, but I can go out there, and it will go through a series of processes, and you'll have a two-line production order, not a one-line production order, because you're really manufacturing a family of items going through the same routing steps at the same time. All right, let's jump back real quickly, talk for another minute or two, and then we'll open it up to questions. Um, pick up where we left off. Again, main thing about production order uh, execution, again, a few important things to worry about is we must make sure we consume and we must make sure we output everything. Again, you can apply different flushing methods to for your bomb. You know, we've got the manual, which uh, you know for me is becoming much more popular, uh, which users you know will ma enter them manually. You've got the automation process, or basically if you want to do the forward flushing, uh, when you release that production order, all the components are consumed. Or backwards flushing, uh, when you change your status to you know release to finish, it'll co it'll consume all your components for all the different operational steps. And again, if you use the routing link code, um, and basically on on the output side of those routing link codes, they'll flush those items in the different routing if you're using routing links based on that operational step. So it is important to pick and choose which flushing method is best for your organization. Again, most popular ones, as I mentioned earlier, manual, very pop, you know, backward flushing and manual are becoming the most popular. If you are gonna do shop floor control or MES, manufacturing execution systems, obviously manual is probably the most advantageous because those systems will afford you the ability to type in your consumption uh, entries during your, uh, when you're doing your production journal entry for output scrap and consumption. So you have some of those abilities right then and there during that process. So again, um, these are some of the execution things you should keep into account when you're fi figuring out your processes. Again, the flushing method. Remember, you go to the item card. Again, the replenishment fast tab. The impact is on the item consumption. So whatever method you pick there, that's what that flushing method is going to be used on that item consumption or on the work center or machine center, the posting fast tab, again, is on the item output and capacity, excuse me, uh, when it does those posting processes. The production journal, of course, combines the two together. You're kind of doing a consumption and output on a single page in BC called the production journal. Um, and again, if you're using one of the apps, that are out there that have a shop floor or MES, um, their, their screens, of course, are tailored to uh, uh, comply with the different um, flushing models here uh, and again, processing steps. Production order posting, don't forget, when you're, you're doing this, you can do it in three steps, consumption journal, materials, output, time and, time and output of the finished product. Or you can do a single step, go to the production journal and combine all three into a single page. Uh, and again, 
I like the production journal. I've been, it, it's something I didn't use in the early days when I was doing NAV or Navision. I kind of was a two-step guy. Um, funny enough, as time went on, when 2016 came out and 2017, I kind of got, you know, married to the production journal. I thought it was a cool little way of doing it. I know different organizations kind of take different paths. So it is going to be a personal preference based on how you like to uh, account for things. But overall, try all three. You'll pick and choose. If you do have an app, your, obviously, the different apps will use their uh, front-end UI tools, but again, um, you're, pro you're going to probably like the production or you can see the big picture. All right, I'm at that point where I've got a couple of minutes left. I'm going to leave my information up here, so in case anybody wants to get a hold of me, as I said earlier in the very beginning, I'm a guy you'll find everywhere, but you want to get a hold of me on anything or talk about manufacturing or your setups or anything about BC in any area. Um, I'll open it up to questions. Thank you, Steve. What an introduction to uh, manufacturing and, and uh, um, to um, really, really great uh, introduction there. Um, just looking at the questions here. Um, so let's take a look. OK, so the first question is from um, here we go. So Chris is asking, how can you apply an issue number to a product top level? I know we can have version number on the bomb level, but what about the top level? Thanks. And an issue number to the top level. So I got a bomb version, a routing version. Um, is this is this more of uh, something that issue numbers are related to sales and uh, more of that because I'm going to be brutally honest. Um, I've never done an issue number uh, to a, in the manufacturing process. I'm not sure if I'm thinking about it along the lines of a version. And I think Chris mentioned you can do versions, but if is this more of an issue from the item card level? Like I'm like if this is issue 88, um, something like that, where I'm thinking of it maybe a variant where I want to have like an my different variants on my different issues. Is it an uh, uh, or something like that. So I, I probably need a little more information only because I've never, I've done some pretty funky things in my years using uh, lately with attributes and with um, variants lately. Um, you know, when I, I want to keep some information, but um, that's the best reply I can give right now. Sure. Um, so Chris, if you could, um, if you could elaborate a little bit, that'd be really helpful. Um, so Nato is asking, is it more common to use standard cost? Oh, yes. Um, I would say in every one that I've done in the last two years, I think there's only one out of 10 manufacturers I'm doing that chose, um, one did actually choose average. Um, they actually now are rethinking it, uh, after being in business for 20 years, they use average. They are hating it because they are realizing it's not a good manufacturing costing methodology. It causes a lot of problems when you look at things and you value things. So they are going to change the standard cost in 2023, but standard cost is the most popular. And the second one in manufacturing is specific costing, where maybe I have a serialized item or a lot item, and I want it to be very specific to that manufacturing process. And I want the cost to come from that manufacturing process. So specific costing is really popular. Serial items or basically lot, you know, something where it's specific, you know, a lot or a serialized item. Thank you. Sultan is asking, can we have approvals when changing or updating a bomb? Ah, I love that one. Um, not out of the box, but guess what? It's BC. I would use Power Automate. I've done many, many approvals that are not in base BC using Power Automate lately. Um, I'm com I, I love it. <laughs> yeah, I'm dabbling in it more and more. Um, I would say if you've never seen Power Automate, Go out there to the YouTubes. Um, you can look for people like Belinda Allen, Mary uh, Mary Myers, who basically are power power gurus, I call them, and they always have trained me over the many years of how to use it. But uh, use Power Automate; it's much simpler. So Gitanjali is asking, can we have costing method as standard for service item? For a service item, um. I mean, you could, but I don't, it's not practical. So under an item card, you've got inventory, you've got service, and you've got non-inventory. For the most part, when it comes to those items, the costing method becomes irrelevant because um, when a non-inventory item is 
posted from the purchase order or the purchase invoice, it's going to look at the general posting setup and just most likely expense it because remember, it's not really an inventory. You're not really inventorying it or trying to capture it on inventory. Um, doesn't mean you can't have it there, but you're not you're not capturing it from from that perspective. Service items are kind of the same thing. Um, I think of service items like fees, installation service, or you know different fees. So again, it's it's mostly just expensed or the revenue is recorded because there's no cost entry side of that um, on the service side because it's a service item. Um, but I I I've never had that you know. Even though service has been out there way, way, way back in time, um, my costing method is I just leave it as FIFO and leave it alone because it's mostly revenue-based uh, transactions. Fantastic. And the final question from Rocco, who's asking if producing something that uses weight for the components, but the output item is sold as a unit piece, for example, bread, can BC report on the expected quantity and the actual finished quantity post-production? So we can see if the employees are following recipes as expected. Out of the box BC, when it comes to the recipe side of the world or the food side of the world, or maybe the formula side of the world, it does an okay job, not a great job. Um, I would say to you, um, I have all my food customers and I do have beer, I've got lemonades, I've got many food products, ice cream and uh, potato chips and nuts. Um, there are great apps out there that only con that concentrate in the food industry. Um, I can think of three off the top of my head immediately, and they work very well. Uh, simple apps to install, and they concentrate from the recipe side of things. So both the recipe, the batch, because remember in food, normally people think of yielding in batches. So you're going to talk more yields and batches than you are go make 25 eaches, if you know what I mean. So it's a little different. You're kind of talking a different method, different terms or different stats you're going to want to develop. So look to the apps, things like Vicinity, um, To Increase Does Food. So those are the two largest players that I know from a North American, South American, you know, and I know they do overseas as well, both of them, especially To Increase, because they came out of, I believe, Copenhagen. Um, but I could be wrong on the, the actual place. Um, but I know they're they're very popular from a food side. Thank you, Steve. Now, I promise this is the Final question. Um, so uh, Chris um, is asking, can resources be used on production BOMs? No, it's items. It's going to be the phantom bomb that you saw, not a resource. Um, people or resources are considered work centers. You'll put your resources there. You'll add them to your routing, and that's kind of where your resources are. If you're thinking resources, my first question to you without knowing your company is going to be, are you doing assembly? Because assembly orders use items and resources, not, not manufacturing. Manufacturing, when you say the word resource, turn, think of work centers or people or machines, that's your resource and that's your routing, but uh, not from a bomb perspective, no. And um, so Chris um, replied basically, so you did answer his question. Um, what Chris mentioned was that it was for an engineering company who receives a drawing from a customer and asked to quote to produce that finished item. The customer may have a slight change to the drawing and call it issue two so the only way i can see this working is through variants so thank you once again you've been really really fantastic steve you really really showed your expertise today and really educated the community on manufacturing in business central so huge kudos make sure you follow steve steve i will share your contact details in the chat so that the community um, have access to that um, so once again, thank you. Make sure you follow Steve Chinks, uh, Stephen Chinsky at uh, whipflea.com. Um, I will share that in the chat as well. Great feedback from Peter and from Matthew and from everyone on the call. Once again, huge, huge, huge thank you for Stephen from joining us all the way from the USA today. Um, thank you very much, Steve. You betcha, everybody. Have a great rest of your day, great weekend, and hopefully I'll see you at one of the conferences uh, either here in the, the States or hopefully I'm going to a few over, overseas. Oh, definitely. Definitely look out for Steve. I, I definitely look forward to meeting you in person, Steve. Thank you once again. You betcha.